everyone to another episode of Nerd RX podcast and I'm your host Barkha. Today we are going to talk about a behavioral technique called self administration and to talk more about that we have Dr. Emily Witt. Welcome Emily to the show. Thank you. And guys uh, Emily also has a podcast. Uh, please make sure to check that out. It's called Cover to Cut. And Emily, thank you so much for giving us your time. So before we jump into the topic, why don't you introduce yourself so we know more about you? Sure, sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. Um so again, my name is Emily Witt. I am originally from Tennessee, so I did my university undergraduate degree at East Tennessee State University. Um, and I got a bachelor's in psychology with a focus in behavioral neuroscience and a minor in biology. And then I went on to attend uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill for grad school, where I worked under um, Dr. Catherine Reis- Reisner. Excuse me. Um, and now I'm doing a postdoc at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Wow, that has been a quite a change from US to Canada. Yes. <laughs> How's the weather treating you by the way? Uh, it's amazing. I love it. I've always enjoyed cooler temperatures. So oh wow. It's been a nice change. Mild summers are amazing. Oh, great. <laughs> so self-administration is the topic you chose for today's episode. So my first question would be what is self-administration mm-hmm. and what got you interested in it? Yeah, so self-administration is a animal model um that is based on the principles of operant conditioning, which is essentially an animal is performing a response and in after it does the response it gets a reward. And the self-administration model that I am most familiar with is lever pressing. Um so it's an automated box entirely with levers in it and the animal goes in and presses a lever and they can get a reward, which can be anything from delivery of food pellets sucrose or sometimes intravenous um injections um and what got me interested in self administration was just kind of exposure to it in the first lab that I ever volunteered with at ETSU in Tennessee um they were doing self administration models with nicotine caffeine and alcohol not all at the same time but in different models <laughs> um so that's kind of what got me interested in it Nice. So self administration uh I think is mostly required to test the abuse liability of a drug, mm-hmm. right? Mhm. Yeah. Yep. So it's a way to test animals motivation um because you can change the parameters for how many lever presses they have to press in order to get a reward and for that you can monitor their motivation level as in how many times are they willing to press the lever for this substance versus this substance and then can we test pharmacological compounds which could reduce their motivation to seek those items yeah okay and how would you describe the experimental setup is like how would you start and how would you finish your experiment sure the first thing is definitely deciding what you want your experimental parameters to be is in you know how do you want your reward to be delivered and what kind of ratio you want it to be delivered on so how many responses equal what reward and then like timeouts in between the response and the reward delivery and all that is written into computer programs um because it's an entirely automated process where you write a program that would be step 1 um to figure out all the different parameters and how long the sessions are um just things like that and then you would need to um we did surgeries on our animals because we had jugular catheters for the delivery mm-hmm. um of the drug reward so that would be step 2 is if you're going to do that it's an entire process to learn the surgical procedures um but i would say those are the two largest hurdles the next bit of self administration is really just automated day to day you take your animal you put it in the box and you let it run entirely automated um and take them out and then at the end you can measure either just the behavior or you can look at changes in neurological things as well okay and so you worked with um uh, mice or rats rats yes oh is there a training period like you have to train the animal Yeah, so we do a training session 
Um, and in that situation, they press the lever for food pellets. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also a food pellet that is dropped every, I think one or two minutes Mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that's just how they've learned to press the lever for food. Yeah. And does it take like a long time to train them? No, just about one session around six hours and most of them get it less than six hours. I know. I remember Ian doing training with mice. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And taking a long time. Rats, thankfully, are much more intelligent. (laughs) Yeah, rats are definitely more intelligent. Yes. Ian, who will also feature on this podcast, um, Mm -hmm. I think he's going to talk about fear conditioning. And I think there is where he's going to talk about all his frustrations in training these mice. I'm looking forward to that episode. (laughs) (laughs) Because I remember talking in the lab meetings and he would be like, these mouse, like, he would take like months and months uh, yes, to just train them. Yeah. yeah. No, this is like a six hour session and most of them can get it within two hours. Every once in a while, you may have to run an animal twice, uh, uh-huh. but usually it's fine. Okay. And how large is the group of animals do you run? Like what is your N? So our N, we're usually, we're doing like, you want 10 per group is usually a good number. Um, but on average, in Dr. Reisner's lab, we were running 16 or 24 at a time. Per group? Mm, just in total for the whole. Okay. Yeah, so we'd have experiment. like 12. Yeah, because you we lost a few due to patency. Right. Um, there always seems to be one. So it's better to have 12 per group and maybe lose one or two. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. So... Uh, are there any alternative techniques you could use other than self-administration mm, to assess so the same things? Not exactly motivation. There is a way to measure preference. So people will use um, condition place preference, which essentially you have a, a three-chambered like rectangle, I guess, mm-hmm. and you inject the animal, animal with whatever compound you're interested in and put it in one side. And then the next day you would inject it with saline and put it in the other side and you continue to do that for a few days. And then you put them in and measure how much time they spend in either chamber. And if they prefer like the substance you're interested in, they will go to wherever they received it. Um, But that really doesn't tell you anything about motivation, um, which is really key in self-administration with lever pressing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So self-administration takes precedent over place preference in terms of motivation. You can even assess the motivation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is the, in this entire process, what is the step that requires a lot of troubleshooting or is the most Mm -hmm. difficult to deal with? Probably surgeries, if you're going to be doing surgeries. That is, I think, the biggest learning curve other than writing programs. A lot of programs are available online, so that's not as big of a hump to get over. Um, And then just the mechanical things that can go wrong in the boxes, I think, can be a hurdle. Um, But other than that, probably just the surgeries and then writing programs, maybe. Okay. And Mm -hmm. so, for example, you have these 20 animals and you have already performed self-administration experiment and you used uh, drug A, for example, Mm -hmm. could you use the same animals for something else or no? Probably not. It would depend on what you wanted to look at. Um, Yeah, but probably not. Okay. Yeah, it depends on what the drug is and what you're interested in looking at, like how separate they would be. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example? Uh, for example, cocaine mm-hmm. and for pain, fentanyl. I wouldn't use the same, same. animals for, yeah, I would do a different cohort. Unless your question was how cocaine self-administration affected fentanyl. Fentanyl, response, okay. I think. Um, we did do a study where we looked at, um, it was just a pilot with a few animals looking at adolescent alcohol intake where mm-hmm. they did um, gavage when mm-hmm. they were adolescents. And then we took the animals as, uh, when they were adults and did cocaine self-administration. Um, yeah, something like that would be an interesting question. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, animal work is always tricky. Yes, and, oh, it's so tricky. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the most time consuming experiments to yes, do. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um so would you say uh, self administration is something that a complete novice could learn easily or there is a learning curve to it? Um I think you could learn it pretty easily. So the like the materials you need like the boxes and the programming like the main company that provides those is pretty good with their manuals mm-hmm. like i learned to program going through their manual like i self taught like going through how to program things that way um yeah i think it takes time but mm-hmm. i think it could be self taught entirely yeah okay and i think it's just probably not surgeries <laughs> yeah i think yeah. the surgeries yeah. is, is the one so i i always thought about this a uh, question and now you mentioned that you perform surgeries um mm-hmm. so is that uh, liver where uh, they have the drug is it connected to the rat to the, get the drug oh, so yeah there's tubing so essentially it runs to their jugular uh-huh. um and then a tubing runs out their back and there's a port that comes out their back and that's what we connect um inside the box and then there's a syringe that's hooked up on a motor um which you program to deliver a certain amount over a certain amount of time when they press the lever. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes mm-hmm. more sense because I would always think uh self-administration how would they <laughs> get the drug? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's okay. so many different ways to deliver things like there's a um like a dipper that is essentially if you can imagine kind of like a seesaw Mm-hmm. they press the lever and it like brings up a certain amount of liquid um and then there's like a pellet dispenser that you can have to drop like sucrose or food pellets mm-hmm. kind of... yeah i think the intravenous is a little time consuming like pellets yes. i i would assume it's easy it's just oh, dropping yes. pellets that is much easier yeah if you're not doing surgery you can do self administration much quicker yeah but then it also depends on what drug are you using right yes. certain yeah. so drug you could requires do alcohol yeah which i yeah that would be oral but something like yes, cocaine mm-hmm. would be intravenous yeah yeah through jugular catheters yeah okay so uh let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of self administration sure um so i think the advantages are really kind of the variability in the information you can get related to motivation um and the number of just models you can run uh just based on how you're changing what is required to get a reward um i think that's the main advantage is that if you're running a progressive ratio you can say that this animal is more or less motivated for this particular mm-hmm. compound um disadvantages i th- i think the startup cost is large i'm not mm-hmm. sure how much the boxes cost but i know they're expensive <laughs> um mm-hmm. yeah and then surgery if you're doing surgery i think is one of those things of a disadvantage maybe mhm yeah that was my next question at the, about the costs involved in running this yeah. experiment <laughs> i i think that is the biggest thing is the the boxes because they're all automated because you likely need a large number if you want to run a lot of animals quickly um, mm-hmm. i think that is the biggest hurdle yeah Okay and even maintaining the animals is added costs. Yes, yeah. And then if something breaks in the box, like that's an added cost and yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you guys have multiple chambers to run this? Yeah, so we thankfully had 24 chambers. When wow. I was an undergraduate, we had only 10 chambers, so I was running like 30 animals but in three separate sessions. So uh-huh. yeah. We were very and... fortunate to have 24. Yeah, that is a big jump uh so how long does this entire experiment take uh once you start running your animal mm that definitely depends on your experimental question for ours we were doing a combination of self administration followed by a period of extinction or abstinence in the home cage um so we did self administration for either 10 or 12 days and then extinction would be roughly 14 to 15 days or if you were doing abstinence it would be closer to 35 or 40 days so combine that's how long that's it would be that's a long experiment 
Yes, it is. But worth it. Yeah. <laughs> good data. So. Yeah. yeah, good data. That is always mm-hmm. uh, the end goal. Yes, um, yeah. So is there any fun fact you would like to share about self-administration? Yeah, so this kind of relates to the principle of offering conditioning was kind of uh, what popularized maybe by B.F. Skinner. If you're familiar with the Skinner box, a self-administration box is essentially a Skinner box. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was very famous for doing pigeons. Um, and apparently in like the 1944 time period with World War II, he was funded by the government to have pigeons learn <laughs> somehow to guide bombs essentially wow. they had a like a screen and it would have a target on it that the pigeons were trained to peck on the target okay. and if they peck the target it would drop a seed and if the target like shifted they would still be pecking it and some kind of sensor would call like be sent to the bomb to have it redirect based on where they were pecking on the screen um yeah apparently it didn't work and bf skinner was known for saying no one would take them seriously, which I think is pretty funny. <laughs> it just sounds ridiculous. But it was prior to computer guidance. So yeah. trying what you can. Yeah, but I'm kind of glad it didn't work. <laughs> Drop yes, the box. I know. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Poor pigeons. <laughs> yeah, so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, some of the great ideas comes through these crazy experiments in yes, science. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's like, well, what if we could do the same thing the pigeons are doing with computerized things? So, you know. Yeah, that would be totally possible <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the things that people are proposing is like a replacement for animal models is computerized, but I don't think that'll be coming soon because <laughs> you have to yeah. know the outcome before mm-hmm. you can program it so yeah yeah so now that you mention i was reading somewhere um uh i think it was in spain where they developed mm. a heart tissue using spinach mm. leaves oh wow yeah <laughs> you should send me, is that an article you should send that to me I'm yeah yeah I, I will i will but i found like if there is a way probably in like 20 years from now if we could like like develop actual organs that would completely um, shut down uh, animal research even organoids yeah. for that matter yes yeah we the uh, there's uh, ideas in the current lab I'm in of starting organoid projects oh so we'll see how that goes <laughs> wow that's interesting uh, mm-hmm. well uh, so my final question to you would be uh, are there any articles or protocols that I could uh, link in the description for our listeners to follow up on? I have my favorite one. Let me pull it up so I can read the title yep. to you. Uh, it's a review. It's called okay. Behavioral Assessment of Drug Reinforcement and Addictive Features in Rodents, an Overview. Uh-huh. Um, and that's by Sanchez Segura. I probably pronounced that wrong. And uh, Spangle, I believe. Okay. Um, and it's just a really great review of all the different things you can do with self-administration and operant conditioning. Um, and then it also has some really nice visual cartoons, which are just kind of fun to look at and get yeah. your the idea of operant conditioning through those. I think it's I gave it to uh, any undergrad that was working with me in the lab, and I found it really useful. Okay, well, I will make sure to link that down in the description. And uh, with this, I'm going to end today's episode. And thank you so much, Emily, for being here with us today. Thank you. Yeah. And guys, please make sure to check out Covered to Cut. And I will catch you guys next week on another episode. And in meanwhile, if you guys have any suggestions about topics or if you would like to get featured on this podcast and talk about something, please email me at barkha at nerdrxpodcast.com and remember, it's good to be a nerd. Bye.